Dan's plugged the tip of an iceberg. Remember how when we first met Doc, he spoke about the iceberg principle and said that what you do, you should only be looking, the tip should be a representation of all the depth and, and the real stuff is actually underneath. Now remember, it wasn't the tip that sank the iceberg, that sank the Titanic, it was what was underneath that was the undoing of the Titanic. So, so we're talking about the tip of an iceberg, looking at that, what Doc would call that technology. And let's see. Okay, so there's an iceberg, and that's about the proportion, about eight-ninths of the iceberg you can't see. And there's just a little tip that's emerging. So if we put Dan's place there, then I wonder what might be underneath. Could we put there our hard work and all our time? Well, yeah, we could put that there. Could we put there our creative ideas? Well, yes, we can put those things there. Could we put our skills? Most definitely. But it really leaves this question, what's missing? What's missing? We could, pardon? It's got to flow out of a heart, yes. Now, that's probably how once we would have seen things in terms of, yes, we... Well, we've produced this, but here's all the hard work and everything else has gone into it. And in a sense, there is not, not detracting from that because we need those things. We need our hard work, we need our time, we need our creative ideas, we need our skills. But the key thing is the heart. And remember the Lord said, if you have a heart of compassion and a heart for people, I can send you thousands. And on your behalf, I said, well, Lord, give us that heart. Um, that's, that's, that's going to be my response. You know, he was having a good time stirring me along at that time. Now, this is a quote from the book of Jude. We don't often read or don't, probably don't reference Jude very often. But with, in Jude, he writes this, Jude 20. But you, dear friends, must continue to build up your most holy faith for your own benefit. Furthermore, to continue to pray in the Holy Spirit. So there's a great exhortation for us. Build up our faith for our benefit. Continue to pray in the Holy Spirit. And remain in God's love as you look for the mercy. Now I've added that out, the mercy, as you look for the persistent and unconditional tenderness, kindness and mercy of our Lord Jesus the Messiah, which brings eternal life. So... Remain in God's love, that's where we're to remain, not our love, but in God's love, as we look for the mercy of our Lord Jesus, the Messiah, which brings eternal life. Show mercy, not merely love, but loyal love, not merely kindness, but dependable kindness, not merely affection, but affection that has com committed itself. I'll come, we'll come back to that. Show loyal love to those who have doubts. So, remain faithful in God's love. Show mercy to those who have doubts. Save others by snatching them from the fire. And show mercy. There's that word again. God sees them as special. In other words, grace, because God sees them as special. Show mercy with fear, hating even the clothing stained by their sinful lives. In other words, hating the sins that contaminate their lives. Now, that's not a bad job description for Dan's place, is it? If we just, just go back, look, look at this. A great way to live your lives. Build up your holy faith. Do that. Let's, let's do it together, dear friends. Build up our holy faith. Continue to pray in the Holy Spirit. Remain in God's love, not our love, but God's love. Show mercy for those who have doubts. Save others by snatching them from the fire. And to others, show mercy, hating even the clothes stained by their sinful lives. Now, there's all sorts of things we could sort of unpack about that. We could sort of talk about that in terms of just applying even to people in the church. But let's just apply it to everybody. And there's a, there's a good place for us to go. Um, I just wonder, there's a light beaming out from that camera. Is that 
necessary. <laughs> anyway, all right. I'll just, I'm just under the light. <laughs> so, <clears throat> there are two New Testament words, and they're basically the same. Greek words that relate to compassion, mercy, or pity. Um, <clears throat> and they've both got a similar strong numbers. One's 1653, one, one, and the other one's 1656. Six. And there's, there's one word, L-A-A-O, which means to have pity or mercy on, to show mercy as God defines it. That is, as it accords with his truth, his covenant truth, which expresses God's covenant loyalty. So, so this word implies, this word that's translated compassion or mercy, has within the meaning of it something to do with God's covenant loyalty. And then there's the Greek word from which that comes, Elios, which is to compassionate. Oh, that's an interesting word, to compassionate. To compassionate. Dan, I want you to go and do a lots of I want you to go and do some compassionating this week. To compassionate by word or deed. But especially by divine grace. So you're compassionate. So by word or deed, you are showing mercy, pity, compassion. And that's translated, isn't this interesting? That's translated from the Hebrew word in the Old Testament, our old friend Hesed. Remember Hesed? Sticky love? That's translated from that word. And it's referring to covenant loyalty or covenant love in the Old Testament. I, find, I found this fascinating. So let's look at compassion and covenant. The Hesed word is the idea of faithful love in action. It's not just love, it's not just sticky love per se, it's actually that in action, being at work. Now God's hesed denotes his persistent and unconditional, now notice that, persistent and unconditional tenderness, kindness and mercy, a relationship in which he seeks after man with love and mercy. Now I'm reminded of that scripture which says in, in um, uh, Matthew 5, be ye perfect, I thought I'd throw in a bit of King James. Be ye perfect, even as your heavenly Father is perfect. And we are imitators of God. And look what we're to imitate. Persistent and unconditional tenderness, kindness, mercy. Now remember, Jude said, show, abide in God's love and then show mercy. Show those mercy to those who are downfall. Show mercy to those um, who need saving. So show mercy to those who you have to snatch from the fire. But show mercy. And that's, so there's a persistent and unconditional tenderness to that mercy, kindness. And that's a relationship that he has with us, which he seeks after us with that love and with mercy. He said again, refers primarily to mutual and reciprocal rights and obligations between parties of a relationship. Remember the word has this linking to Hesed, to covenant. So in Hesed, there's a, there's a mutual and reciprocal right. So God covenanted with the Israelites. He said, you obey me and I will look after you. That was the covenant. So there's a sense of obligation. So God has obligated himself to save Israel. Now, Israel then, in turn, obligated themselves to love and obey God. But this is the interesting thing about Hesed. It's not just a matter of obligation, but it's also generosity. Because God went beyond that because Israel didn't always obey God. In fact, often Israel never obeyed God, it would seem. So it's not only a matter of loyalty, but of mercy. Okay, so it's a matter of generosity, not just obligation. It's a matter of loyalty and mercy. This is describing this word. Hesed implies a personal involvement and a commitment in a relationship beyond the rule of law. Okay, so it's something that goes beyond the rule of law, so that, that when you're in this, 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 this hesed, if, you got, if you're heseding, as it were, with somebody, then it's not just maybe like a marriage contract or something else. It actually goes beyond that. 
beyond just the mere law itself. So consider this, Isaiah 58 verse 8, sorry, 54 verse 8. In an outburst of anger, I hid my face from you for a moment, speaking to the nation of Israel. But with everlasting loving kindness, the word there is hesed, with everlasting loving kindness, I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. A different word for compassion or mercy is used there at that point. But notice, with everlasting loving kindness, that's the hesed. I will have mercy on you, says the Lord. Verse 10, for the mount, same, same chapter in Isaiah, for the mountains may be removed and the hills may shake, but my loving kindness, my hesed, will not be removed from you and my covenant of peace will not be shaken, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. Or who has mercy. Again, another different Hebrew word being there, but loving kindness, that hesed. Lamentations 3.22, the Lord's loving kindness, the Lord's hesed, indeed never cease. For his compassions never fail. That never ceases. It's important for us to understand this and, and sort of think about this. Okay, a bit more on Hesed. It's related to the biblical, biblical concept of covenant and also to the idea of grace in that Hesed was and is extended by God when it was not deserved, such as he did to Israel. In fact, Hesed is never deserved. That's the very nature of it. Even though it's locked into this covenantal relationship that God has with Israel and has with us. God's hesed is his persistent, unconditional tenderness, kindness and mercy. A relationship in which God seeks after man with love and mercy. Do you get a sort of a sense of, hey, maybe we could take this concept, this idea, this value, this way of living and sort of build it into our iceberg for Dan's place? What do you reckon? Don't you think this, this, this could be right at the very core, the driving thing of Dan's place becomes that? Hesed is not merely love, but loyal love. Think about this. It's not just love, it's loyal love. It's not kindness, but dependable kindness. It's not merely affection, but affection that's committed itself. Just think about that for a moment. Let's just put maybe in the context of, of Dan's place. So somebody comes, and, and um, so we, we love them. We show kindness to them, and, and we show affection to them. That's one level. But what happens when they don't come? Or, or what happens when they come and, and upset the apple cart? do something wrong? What happens when they go outside and bad mouth us or, or just do something, just, just really come in and, and just do stuff that makes us want to scream? Pardon? Oh, well, we've been able to handle bringing their dog. <laughs> what happens? Hesed says it's not merely kindness but dependable kindness. You will be able to depend on our kindness when you come whether you come and, and make pasta for us or not, when you come, whether you want to um, just make a mess, whether you just want to use us, you can still find our kindness will be dependable. Our affection towards you will be dependable. Our love for you will be dependable. It's not merely love. It's not merely kindness. It's not merely affection. It's stuff that we can depend upon. It's affection that's committed. Because that's how God heseds us. That's, that's, a, that's why this is a beautiful word. There's no one word that can, no singular word that can really encapsulate this Hebrew word hesed. Let's have a look at it in action. Remember the story of Jonathan and David in, uh, in uh, 1 Samuel. <clears throat> Jonathan, remember David is... is, is uh, been appointed as king, anointed as king. He's taken on Goliath. He's, he's come into the household of, of Saul, the king, and Saul has a son, Jonathan, and Jonathan's in line for the throne. He's the, he's the heir. He's the, he, he will be the next king, but David has been anointed as king. And Jonathan and David have an incredible bond between them. So much so... Let's see the description here. 
that David, because of that bond, David, when David was in trouble, and that's in verse 8, we'll see in a minute, in chapter 18 of 1 Samuel, David and, and Saul enter into this bond. It's actually a covenant. Two chapters later, David's in trouble. He's in trouble because Saul wants to kill him. And he goes to Jonathan, he says, I want you to help me. I'm in deep trouble. I need your help. So in 1 Samuel 20 verse 8, David says to Jonathan, As for you, show kindness or loyalty. And guess what? The word is, yes, it. Show kindness. Show, in some translations say loyalty. Show Hesed to your servant, that's to me, for you have brought him into a covenant. You and I have entered into a covenant with you before the Lord. If I'm guilty, you can kill me. But if I'm not, don't hand me over to your father. Okay, so this is what David was actually doing. On the basis of that covenant, he could believe that Jonathan would look after him because Jonathan had entered into a covenant with Yahweh. We read about that in 1 Samuel 18.3. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. So they entered into a covenant. Two chapters later, David's actually got a call on that covenant, but he does it with an expectation that he can depend upon Jonathan. Now think about Hesed in this concept as well. We may not have a covenant as in terms of a biblical covenant we might see with the people out there. But in effect, that's what our heart has to be like that. So that in trouble, they can actually come and call upon us. And we have to be there for them. That's what Hesed is. So let's see what happens with Jonathan and David. See, the covenant gives David reason to look for and depend upon Hesed or devoted love. Now, crucially, Jonathan's covenant was an expression of love initiated by love. In other words, Jonathan loved David and David loved Jonathan. Out of that love, and we're not talking about a sexual love here, so don't let other people get hung up on that. Out of that love, Jonathan and David covenanted before the Lord. Love, covenant. Not covenant, then love. Love, then a covenant. It's important to notice that because that's how God operates with us. Love gives itself in covenant and gladly promises devoted love in that covenant. Then the covenant partner rests in security of that promise and may appeal to that. That's, that's the whole nature. You think about that with us. See, David could appeal to Jonathan. You think about that for us in our situation. That was one of the song, part of one of the songs. I think the first song, song we were really singing was an expression of that. Of that covenantal love. So, in confusion and trouble, take yourself to the one person who's made a covenant with you. That's what David did in Psalm, in Psalm 17. Lord, I'm in trouble. And he appealed to the Lord. See, when we prayed for Lisa this morning, when we prayed for Mick last week, when, when you pray, you're actually tapping into that hesed, into that covenantal love. You can depend upon God. So you can go to him in time of trouble or confusion and say, help me. That old, old hymn always associated with the Salvation Army. I now I know why. We used to have a Salvation Army. When they used to do scripture in schools a long, long time ago, the various Protest Protestants would have various representatives come and do scripture. And so I was a Methodist in those days in school, but every now and again the Sally man would turn up. And he'd turn up with his... Um, what do you call it? Squeeze box? It's called it's got a special name. Accordion, that's it. And we would sing, What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. And so we go on and then have you trials and temptations? And often it'll go again. You see, in times of confusion and trouble, take yourself to the one person. He was made a covenant with you. We can do that. If we can get that real sense, I mean, even just as I was doing this yesterday, Mary heard me. I was getting really excited. Oh, this is so good, just diving into the scriptures. 
And my faith is just increasing just thinking about this. I know we know it up here, but it's just excess of my faith. My spirit man is rising up with just a sense of confidence in this. So in David's disintegrating world, there was yet one space of sanity, one refuge still intact, Jonathan. Now I want to tell you, for people, not just us, but for people out there, Dan's place may become the one place of sanity, the one refuge. No, just even just talking with somebody not in the kingdom, not coming to church, um, but just talking in a, in, a, in a business sense and explaining how one of his people and the place where this person is and then this person's in a place where he's just sort of in lockdown and then, but it's not just him, it then affects some of his relatives because they're tied up with them, but then those relatives are sort of, okay, well, in this case it's of a son looking after his dad, but but then the son's got his own relationship that he's trying to fix up and, and it's all this incredible, it's just a mess, it's complicated. Now whether he takes it up or not, I don't know, but the offer's been made to be able to help. Because you see, where else can they go? It is an impossible situation, where else can they go? We must never forget we've always got a one place of sanity, a space of sanity, a place of refuge. And that's what Dan's place can be if we're operating out of Hesed. And then David was to reciprocate that years later. So now let's look at David and look at Jonathan and David, Hesed in action. Let's look at David and Jonathan, reverse it round, Hesed in action. Second Samuel 9. Then David said, Is there yet anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness? Show him Hesed. Saul's now dead. Jonathan's dead. As far as he knows, all the household of Saul has been wiped out, but he had made a covenant to Saul, uh, to, 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 uh, to Jonathan. And it actually said that, that um, um, I think it's, it's fascinating this. Thank you what Jonathan had said to David um, back when they made their covenant. It's really struck me this morning as I was looking at this. Um, I won't try and it looks like I'm not going to be able to find it straight away, but it was the essence of it was Oh here we go. Jonathan said this it's one Samuel twenty and verse thirteen, he's talking about his father. He says, If he's angry and wants to wants you killed, may the Lord strike me and even kill me if I don't warn you so you can escape and live. May the Lord be with you as he used to be with my father, and may you treat me with the faithful love, the hesed, love of the Lord, as long as I live. But if I die, this, how prophetic was this? If I die, treat my family with this faithful love, even when the Lord destroys all your enemies from the face of the earth. There's Jonathan saying, if I die, I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to look after you. I'll let you know if Dad's going to kill you. I'll let you know. And what's more, when all your enemies have been defeated, and if I'm dead, look after my family. Second Samuel. Oh, I love this stuff. Sorry, I'm getting a bit tingly. Then David said, Is there anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness, Hesed, for Jonathan's sake? And the king said, Is there not anyone yet of the house, house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness? This is He's talking to Zia, um, an old servant of Saul's. And, Z and Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan who is crippled in both feet. And then Shibabeth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face, prostrate himself. And David said, Miss Shibabeth, and he said, Here is your servant. 
And David said to him, Do not fear, for I will surely show Hesed kindness to you for the sake of your father Jonathan and will restore to you all the land of your grandfather Saul and you shall eat at my table regularly. Isn't that awesome? I, I just, it's just, there's just something in that. There was, there was Hesed love. Jonathan, remember Jonathan, would have been in Jonathan's interest to have David killed because then Jonathan would have got to the throne, at least in, 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 in the eyes of the flesh. And now here's David reciprocating to Jonathan's son, who's totally crippled and can't do a thing for himself. So David, a man after God's own heart, seeks to honour the covenant which is cut with Jonathan, even though Jonathan is dead. I just, I just love this. God's hesed. So God's hesed flows ultimately not from a formal covenant promise, but from the very nature of a covenantal God, Yahweh. In Exodus chapter 34 and verse 6, we read this. And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding, abounding in hesed, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining hesed to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children, the children for the sins of the parents, to the third and the fourth generations. Here he is. Here's the Lord, abounding in love, abounding in kindness, abounding in faithfulness. Now the context to that scripture is Israel actually at that point had no claim. They had no covenantal claim on Yahweh's hesed because they'd breached the covenant. In chapter 32, they were worshipping a golden calf, Remember? That's what they would do. They'd cut off. They, they disobeyed God completely. They had no, they were totally, they totally breached the covenant. And yet he was God. My abounding hesed. This is awesome. Israel receives hesed because it flowed from Yahweh's heart because of he of who is abounding in hesed and faithfulness and fidelity. This is this is, his, this is Dan's place. This is what Dan's place is going to be. Abounding, abounding in hesed and faithfulness. If we translate the Hebrew of Exodus 34, 6, that's the hesed into Greek. That brings us into that word um, elios. Remember I said right at the beginning, it brings in the word elios, compassion, pity, mercy. And if you sort of follow that through, where really, really brings us into Him, who is full of grace and truth, as we read about Jesus in John 1:14, full of grace and truth, because that's God's unconditional love pouring out. So, you seek Hesed, and we simply find ourselves in the arms of Jesus. Isn't that awesome? That's where we get to. Okay, Hesed is central to God's character. It's closely tied, as we've seen, to his covenant and his chosen people, but it's not bound by the covenant, as we've seen that. It's not bound because, in a sense, God will still keep his covenantal promise, but he's not bound to sort of say, well, I'll dismiss you, Brahman, because you disobeyed. He's not bound by that. His love goes beyond that. And so though men may prove unfaithful to this relationship, God's hesed is everlasting. Okay. So if you if you just if you just make yourselves at home, lady, ladies, wherever you feel at home. If you feel, I wasn't just saying just Brahman, it's everyone. If you step outside the covenant, God's love is still there. That's the incredible thing about it. That love is everlasting. Isaiah fifty-eight again, fifty-four verse eight. In an outburst of anger, I hid my face from you for a moment. Man, this is awesome. But with everlasting kindness, or hesed, I'll have compassion upon you, says the Lord your Redeemer. So, that the keeping the, the, the sort of point about linking hesed to covenant is it makes it, that doesn't mean it just being, oh, God's love for everybody, um, which he does have. But it's something that applies particularly to God's love for his chosen and covenantal people. Um, but it goes beyond 
that covenant, as we've seen. Now, here's an interesting statement. In its final and its final, its final trumpet implement, it's, it's eschatological. Eschatological to do with end times, to do with the finish. Ultimately, it's to do with the finish. The finish is what? The finish is the fullness of Christ. The finish is the fullness of Christ, Ephesians 4.13. The end goal of apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, an evangelist is Christ. Verse 12. His intention was the perfecting. This is in giving, remember Jesus has given out apostles, etc. His intention was the perfecting and the full equipping of the saints that they should do the work of ministering towards building up Christ's body. That it might develop until we all attain oneness in the faith and the comprehension of the knowledge of God that we might arrive at a really mature manhood and that maturity is the completeness of personality which is nothing less than the standard height of Christ's own perfection. In other words, maturity is in we are Christ-like. And that's the whole point of Hesed, to get us to that point. Back to Jude 20. You, dear friends, must continue to build your most holy faith for your own benefit. Furthermore, continue to pray in the Holy Spirit, remain in God's love as you look for the mercy of our Lord Jesus, the Messiah, which brings eternal life. Show mercy to those who have doubts. Save others by snatching them from the fire. To others, show mercy with fear, hating even the clothes stained by their sinful lives or the sins that contaminate their lives. Now, here's another ripper from Micah. Micah 6 verse 8. He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy. To love hesed. You knew that it would have to be there at the finish as well, didn't you? And to walk humbly with your God. Isn't that awesome? I just think this is so good. This is so good. So if we're talking about Dan's place. Look at Dan's place. If you have a heart of compassion, hesed, and a heart for people, I can send you thousands. You love them. This God also said this, November the 5th last year. You love them, care for them, and respect them, and I'll compel them to come. How about that? You love them, you respect them, you care for them, and I'll make them come. I created you for vastness, not bigness. We spoke about that, how when I was speaking with Craig Stevens, and I, when, I said, well, when he said, well, what do you do when you get thousands? I said, well... I guess by then we'll be equipped for He said, well, yes, or maybe you could have Narara Valley Baptists and Aaron Salvos and all the rest involved in it. Yes. The prophetic words, we spoke about those a few weeks ago. Prophetic words to Mary and Max, to Trevor and Kath, to Kevin and Marcy, to Mal. Very prophetic words, talking about this very thing, effectively Dan's place. So, and the most important thing, that iceberg underneath is God's hesed in us. Amen? Out of that, everything else will come. Out of that's, that's what... There's the technology that Doc described to us years and years ago. The iceberg principle. Dan's place is what people will see. What they're going to get is all that. All that is what will produce Dan's place. So just encourage us in that as we have this covenantal meal now to celebrate Hesed. So can we distribute those, please? Um, Paul, good on you, Paul. Thanks, Paul. Covenantal love, amazing love. Uh, 
I love this when people can just walk in from outside and wave to you in church and <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. Been in, interested in Dan's place. Oh, I know one of them anyway. <laughs> love it. Just love God working. Probably good we've got a word like hesed, which we can't sort of, it's not an English word, and it sort of encompasses so much because our English is so, so limited. There's not one word, not just one word that we can, we can capture this incredible thing about God. But I guess to me what really spoke to me as I was sharing it, but I didn't realise at the time, was the story of Jonathan and David. The fact that David could go and appeal on the basis of that covenantal love and Jonathan could respond and then remind David of his obligation under that and how David responded. And then just that absolute sense that we can run to God in our confusion, in our sad circumstances, in our good circumstances, but we can go on the basis of that covenantal love which he established when he said, Behold, the days are coming in Jeremiah when I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel, not like the one I did before, and I will write my laws on their hearts. Take it away from a letter of the law to something in the spirit, to something living. And he repeats, the, the writer of the Hebrews repeats that same, quotes Jeremiah again. A new covenant achieved, and you, you read Hebrews 8, and you go into Hebrews 9, and and. And then so our great high priest Jesus, sprinkling the blood, not many times, but once. Not someone else's blood or something else's blood, but his own blood. And doing once for all, and then we can enter boldly before the throne of grace. All because of what Jesus has done. He said love. And we're going to take that, and we're going to put a structure around it, and it's called Dan's Place, and that's just a structure of this hesed, God's hesed flowing through us out into the community. I don't think it gets much better than that. So, Lord, we thank you. Thank you for that blood was your blood that you sprinkled, that it was your body that was sacrificed. Lord, and you demonstrated, you demonstrated the ultimate demonstration of hesed of love, of loyalty, of continuing affection, of committed kindness. Lord, as we take this, as we do each week, Lord, we don't do it lightly. We say, Lord, thank you for your body. Thank you for your blood. And we remember your death and proclaim your resurrection till you come again. Amen. Let's eat and drink together.